excited. Welcome. Uh, welcome to I Have a Dream to Invent. We have a great speaker today with us. We have Stephen Key here today, and we also have Ms. Sherry, Sherry Renee here. But I want to let everyone know about our ideabounce.com platform. This is a great platform. Uh, we have inventors here. And if you have any idea, any concept, just jot it down. Go to ideabounce.com, share your concept. And this is a worldwide platform that you can talk with other inventors just like yourself. But once again, this is about Stephen Key's presentation. And Sherry, if you can go ahead and get us off. Well, welcome everyone. I am Sherry Renee, and I am president of the Inventors Association of St. Louis, uh, in addition to the Invent Ed Network Connection. And what we're going to do is we have, first of all, we have an action act uh, presentation for you today, uh, covering everything that you want to hear. I should let you know that I'm not just the president of an inventors association or group, but I am also an inventor. So I totally get it. I totally get the years of frustration, the exhaustion as far as uh, conducting your own research to learn the mechanics uh, or the makings of your particular product or, or idea, or having multiple ideas and having to choose between one or the other uh, when you're in love with uh, both or all of them. Uh, today, we're going to provide you with the information you need to help actualize or bring your product to market, actualize your ideas, you know, actually put them on paper, turn them into 3D prints or prototypes or something, uh, and or not, and develop sell sheets, we'll talk about that, uh, sell sheets so that you can actually license them uh, along with some other things. However, I know a lot of you, uh, about 500 of you uh, signed up for this particular session. I know a lot of you signed up because you're very familiar with Stephen Key and you know very well what he does through InventRight. I'm, I'm sorry, InventRight. But uh, I want to also take this time uh, with a few slides to help you to fully appreciate his history and what he's done. But I also want to introduce Stephen Key to you uh, as far as those of who have not are not familiar with this, happen to stumble upon this particular session and you're not familiar with his background. Uh, and what we're offering today and the magnitude of the information that you're about to receive. So with that said, I'm gonna go through uh, the PowerPoint slides and I'm gonna take about five, to seven minutes and then I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen and he's going to talk for about an hour to an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, and then we're going to leave a substantial amount of time, something that most uh, webinars don't do, where you can pose as many questions as you may have. So that's going to leave you with about 30 to 40 minutes to ask questions. We do ask that you postpone your line of questioning for the last 30 minutes, because what's going to happen is they're going to get lost because there's so many of you that are signed up uh, via the live uh, view or, and then also the chat. So keep that in mind. So with that said, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, as we mentioned, this is learn the key to licensing success with emphasis on key because this is coming from Stephen Key's expertise. Um, it, as you know, featuring Stephen Key, I am your host, Sherry Renee, and I am in good company and so are you because this particular event is brought to you in collaboration uh, with the Inventors Association of St. Louis, Washington University, uh, Scandalera Center, who's sponsoring the, the, uh, the Zoom, uh, InventEd Network uh, Connection, in addition to InventRight. Now, what I want to help you to appreciate is this is a session that's part of a, a number of uh, classes that were offered for the in preparation for this. And it was called the and it is called the I Have a Dream to e in Invent event. And as you can see, uh, the co-sponsors of the event here. But I want you to appreciate more so than anything. But it's not just this class. This is something that we have come together collectively uh, to give rise to a national inventor advocacy and outreach effort that will help you to network and connect and benefit from resources so that you actually become invented. It's not enough that you get a patent or a provisional patent application filed 
or a utility patent um, uh, granted or anything of that nature, We're just, or to just get licensed. We want you to have an, a final product that you can take pride in. And not only that, but to commercialize, because after you re you're granted a patent, it's important that you know how to bring it to market, whether it's through licensing or another means. And I want you to take note of the um, uh, co-sponsors on this particular list, because there are services that we provide to you beyond the licensing or as a supplement to your licensing, no matter where you are in the country. So keep that in mind. Invented Network Connection, I'll just tell you something uh, about it, but it also represents, even though this is our slogan, uh, so to speak, it also represents what every uh, organization that's involved in this effort uh, is basically dedicated to doing. Providing you with classes, information, sessions, webinars to help you obtain information quicker. And in an effort for you to actually become invented and not forever suspended in proto uh, prototype development or product development. And we want to save you time and money, give you the knowledge, information, empower you, uh, because a lot of you are resourceful and then some of you are very capable. You are uh, most definitely DIYers to the fullest. So if you had the knowledge, you would be able to use the knowledge. And speaking of knowledge, we want you to have enough sufficient information that you can act upon it instantly. And that's the beauty of this particular session is that you're going to be able to, <laughs> it's going to be so fantastic. You're literally going to be able to get offline, log out and start your innovation uh, development uh, or product development in your own way based upon the tips that uh, Stephen is going to provide you with today. Another thing I want you to be able to pay attention to and appreciate is that each of us have our own innovation path that we're going to have to create. Even if we're uh, uh, creating the same type of product, we're both creating dolls. Your knowledge base may be more advanced than mine as far as uh, the makeup of the doll, where my financial resources may be greater. So everyone is going to have to identify the resources that they need and have to go on their own individual paths. But what we're hoping to be able to provide you with is a linear path that's progressive so that there's a standard uh, uh, direction that you can go in so that you'll know what you need to do or what needs to be done. So keep that in mind. Uh, just to give you a little background, this is something, it's ironic that we are having an I Have a Dream to Invent event uh, because uh, just last year, January 15th, uh, no exaggeration, 2020, I posted, I was on my way to uh, do a lot of traveling and I actually was actively traveling uh, to bring up two products to market and finalize the uh, licensing deals and everything at the final licensing expo in Las Vegas. And then of course, what happens, just like you, I was <laughs> set back because of the pandemic. And so it was postponed. The licensing expo was postponed until August, and that never happened. But nonetheless, so I was actually in on January 15, 2020, it, the pandemic, we weren't in a pandemic. But for some reason, I was already thinking about coming back and helping you guys because it was important to me that you guys have that experience of that joy, excitement of knowing that you're nearing the finish line. And I started collecting uh, my ideas and notes about how I was going to come back and share this information or give rise to organizations, uh, resources, classes that will help you get to the finish line, something that Stephen Key is already doing. So there's evidence that this was on um, my post because normally when someone posts Martin Luther King on his birthday, it's like, I have a dream. But for some reason it's, do you have a dream? And this is not about me. I'm bringing this up because Stephen Key was surprised that I asked him to present on Martin Luther King Day. And this ties into where we're going next. So sure enough, uh, I am shopping on Amazon during quarantine in November and they recommend a book. And it's a Stephen Key book. And I'm like, I know Stephen Key. I'm familiar with his videos and things like that. So it was not foreign to me, but I'm like, how do you know that I'm an inventor? <laughs> 
And I'm like, what is he doing with the new book? He already has a great book out. And so sure enough, they recommended his new book. And I'll talk about that in just a second, too. Uh, they recommended his new book. And so I got it. And then it was at Aud it was on audible.com. And so because it was an audio book and there was another audio book by Stephen Key, I got two of them. So it was a wonderful opportunity. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, everyone, and I, after reading it, and I'm, I'm sorry, listening to it and going around the house and, and it was never off. Once, I mean, I took three days to read a 400 page book. Uh, and so what I'm saying to you is that I had no idea that this information was out there to the degree that it was as far as you know how to license yourself. So here I was thinking that I had to wait another year before licensing a product because I had to wait until the, it was safe again to go to the licensing expo uh, in 2021. And then Stephen Key raised an eyebrow and made me realize you could do this yourself. You don't have to wait. And that's when I said, everyone needs to know this. So we gave, it gave rise to the I Have a Dream to Invent event, and that's what you're benefiting from today. And it was important to me to make it January 15th, 2021, because it goes back to, do you have a dream? I'm coming back for you. And here we have this event. So you have ideas. So the pandemic response is this, opportunity uh, at its finest. You have your ideas. You guys are in quarantine. Uh, Everyone is sponsoring free online events, that licensing expo that costs thousands of dollars to attend in total, hotel stay and things like that, is now available free of charge, uh, and along with other things. So the opportunity was there. So I was thinking, how could we get individuals to achieve? It's not enough to just go to these licensing expos and events. How can we get inventors to achieve their dreams sooner than later? And do you know the only answer or the only key was Stephen, pun intended. <laughs> and so I put two and two together and I said, I have to reach out to Stephen Key because I need, and by this time I had already talked to the Washington universities and the St. Louis universities and the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and they were on board. But then it wasn't enough for me because I felt that even though those resources are fantastic, they're ongoing and we can tell you about that at the end of the session. Uh, but what was important to me is that you guys had information that you that's immediately applicable and that during a pandemic, you can still exercise and, and bring a product to market with the limited resources that you have. And only Stephen has the key for that opportunity. So fast forwarding through the remainder of these slides, I wanted to introduce you to Stephen Key because he is the expert to licensing. Uh, I don't care where you look and uh, whether it's uh, Bing.com, Google.com, you type in licensing, you'll read this fantastic article, uh, Forbes Magazine, Inc. Magazine, uh, you name it. Uh, uh, what is it? Entrepreneur.com. And when you, and you're like, this is fantastic. And you get to the bottom of the uh, article and you'll find out that it's written by Stephen Key. Who knew? <laughs> so when I'm telling you that you are in good hands and the information that you're going to receive today is going to be fabulous and outstanding. I mean, I really can't find the words to express and emphasize that enough. Stephen has five book publications. 24 patents himself, and 20 honors and awards. As I mentioned, he's a contributor to the Forbes, Inc., and Time, and you name it. You can see that yourself. Here are a few of his awards uh, that he's won uh, over the years uh, for his inventing. Here's the book that I told you about that was recommended. Notice, five stars here. And so I knew this going into it. And uh, here's the thing, guys. <laughs> it gets better. I didn't read all of this. I didn't need to. I've all, I was already familiar with Stephen Key. So that meant that all I needed is give me the book and let's get going. It was on audio, uh, you know, an audio version of two of them. So I, I received two. But what I didn't do is read this because if you do, he's got littered throughout this. He's living his dream, 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 dream. It just keeps coming up. He had already agreed to participate in the session. Uh, before I had learned about this. And if that weren't enough, do you notice when this book is published? <laughs> it was meant to be, guys. 
that's all I can say. Here are his other books, and we're just zooming through that because you can come back to the video later to uh, familiarize yourself with that. He's also um, um, uh, has a uh, has a partnership with uh, Andrew Cross with Invent Right TV. You can find them. Uh, on YouTube to look at all the videos, success stories, uh, and uh, information and tutorials about licensing. So this is not the only um, way that you can get this information. Uh, what they do uh, collectively is connect you with companies looking for ideas. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the companies, you have Reebok, uh, Oral-B, you name it. And also, uh, they uh, are able to get their clients into stores such as Walmart, Bed Bath & Beyond, and more. So if you have a dream uh, of a product that you'd like to bring to market, you are in the right place. This session is going to help you to get your new product or idea and design in front of major, uh, major brands to gain their interest. It's going to help you minimize and eliminate the need for manufacturing and developing a business and, and garage storage and all of those things. It's also going to help you to sell your ideas and license them yourself or with alongside an attorney. Totally up to you. Stephen will talk about that. It'll introduce you to licensing agreements, though I, I don't think we're going to go too deep into it, but just an introduction uh, to that process and offer you key tips on how to per, uh, pitch your product ideas to targeted licensees. With that said, you're going to end up with your dream job that lies ahead, and you're going to learn how to uh, take the steps to begin the licensing process. You're going to learn about sales sheets. That's important. Uh, to uh, getting your foot in the door with companies. And this is a sample sales sheet, something you can come back and revisit, uh, how to make the initial calls to targeted licensees. Uh, and also here's a sample of the license agreement and, and the pros and cons to entering into licensing agreements with or without an attorney. Uh, and this is something I'm just gonna keep here so that you can reference later uh, as far as the different types of licenses that you can enter agreements that you can enter into. and we're going to also provide you that last 30 to 40 minute session where you we can provide, well, Stephen, can provide you answers to your many licensing questions to help you achieve your dream. So with that said, I'm turning it over to Mr. Stephen Key, author, inventor, entrepreneur, product developer, and speaker and, of, and, and co-owner of InventRight, Master of Art of Licensing. It's all yours, Stephen. Well, I cannot thank you enough for the opportunity to, to share this information with everybody. And I'm excited. I'm excited because what I'm going to share with you today is that anybody, anywhere in the world, I don't care if you're 18 to 82, you all have the opportunity now to take those ideas, to bring them to market in such a way that doesn't require things that you think it does. It doesn't require uh, things like um, sometimes prototypes, starting a business, uh, all the things like writing a business plan, all the traditional ways that we've been taught to, to bring products to market. And what's really incredible, we have been taught that we have to start a business. And today I'm gonna to talk about that you do not have to start a business. You don't have to raise money. You don't have to write a business plan. Anyone, anyone, anywhere in the world can do this process of licensing. And that's what this presentation is gonna be about today. So first of all, what I need to do is, um, Sherry, I have your presentation still here. Oh, there you go. Perfect, thank you. And let's see. Can you see it, Sherry? My presentation. Let's make sure I get it. I this. do. I see it. Perfect. That's all I need. Um, like I said, I'm going to show you the fastest way for anybody that's creative that really wants to see their product shared by others. Because that was my dream. You know, my dream when I first started out was that I wanted to be creative and I wanted people to see my creativity. And I wasn't quite sure how to do that. Um, but I did figure it out and I'm going to share with you because there's nothing like seeing this, you know, having this idea in your head. And next thing you know, 
you see people using it or you see it on a store shelf or, or maybe there's a commercial, but it all starts here. And to see people enjoy it, there's, there's, a, there's never been a greater feeling for me and I know for you that's, that's watching it today to experience that, that time when people can really enjoy it. So that being said, I'm gonna jump ahead and I'm gonna go through this presentation. We're going to talk about product licensing. It's the fastest way to bring those ideas to market. And you're going to absolutely love this because you can do it. That's, that's the one message I want to leave with everybody today. You can do this because I get to see people do this process every single day. And I get to see people at every different age all around the world bring their ideas to market through product licensing. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna start at the very beginning because I think people need to understand, um, because I think there's gonna be a lot of listeners that are maybe in college and they're not quite sure what to do. Um, and they're not quite sure, what do they wanna pursue? I started my, my career at Santa Clara University in, in Santa Clara, California, and I was a business major. My dad thought it was the greatest um, occupation to go into business. So I said, yes. So I became a uh, business ma major at Santa Clara University. And I realized the first year I was not really enjoying myself. And so by accident, I took an art class just to kind of take an easier class. That's all it really was. And I found myself really loving working with my hands. And I remember I, I went home and I told, I said to my dad, I said, I, I want to drop out of Santa Clara. <laughs> and he was like, what? And I said, yes, I want to drop out. And I, I want to become an artist. And I, I want to transfer over to another school that has a larger art department because I want to be an artist. And my father said to me, well, that's great, Steve. He said, um, do you love to paint? And I said, well, no. And he said, well, you must love to, to, to draw. And I said, well, no. And so he gave me some wonderful advice. He gave me permission to jump off that ledge. He said, Steve, find something you really truly love and you'll never work a day in your life. So I took the leap. I transferred over to another school, San Jose State University. They had a very large art department. I was a little overwhelmed because here I'm, you know, a sophomore in college and I'm taking art classes for the first time and I'm not an artist. But I just knew this, this, this magical feeling with creating something with your own hands. And, and I realized though, after working with other artists and taking classes, I was never gonna be a great artist. And I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. So, I decided once I left that I would just make things. I would combine my creative side with part of the business I learned at Santa Clara and just make things and sell them. And I made uh, stuffed animals. I mean, it was easy to make because it, all you needed was fabric and a sewing machine. And one of my events you see here, this is at San, San, Jose, um, San Jose in California. And everybody thought I was out of my mind. My family, my friends, they were like, Steve, what are you doing? You know, we're, we're getting married, we're, we're buying homes and you're selling things at street corners um, and county fairs, state fairs. And, and I said, yes, and I, and I love it. In fact, I felt at that point, I was the richest man in the world. And I could tell they just didn't get it. And, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot about people. I learned about coming up with ideas very quickly because at the end of the day, that magical transition of making a transaction, of making something and selling it, to me was really a big deal. That wasn't easy to do, but I could test my ideas and get feedback every Saturday and Sunday. And if, if I, it forced me to come up with good ideas because if I didn't, I didn't pay the rent. So it wasn't easy to do, but, but the lessons I learned were priceless. Now, I'm in Fremont, California, 
And I read this article uh, about this startup company called Worlds of Wonder. And they, they had a picture of this prototype that you can see over here in the, the far, far, far left. And the prototype didn't look very good. It, it looked a little crazy. And, and it was a startup company and they were in Fremont. So I said, well, I'm just going to knock on their door on Monday and see if, if they'll hire me because I was pretty good at making stuffed animals. And I thought I could make Teddy look a little cuter. So I just went down, knocked on the door and said, you guys, you need me. I can make Teddy look cuter. And the Worlds of Wonder ended up hiring me. And I ended up being manager of design at Worlds of Wonder. And, and it was my first job. It was my first job with the paycheck. And I'm 28 years old. And of course, everybody's happy for me. My family's excited. And my friends, like, finally, he's got a job. And I learned a great deal um, at Worlds of Wonder. We launched Teddy Ruxpin. It sold 5 million teddies. At $89, we became, uh, I think, the fifth largest toy company in the world with one idea. Uh, I was able to be involved in laser tag and all these great products. And I got to, to work over in the Far East. My job at Worlds of Wonder was, was to build a prototype, take the prototypes, make them look better for production, and then take them over to the Far East and other places in the world to have them manufactured. So I'm on the production line. Um, where Teddy's being packed out. You can see the picture here. And it dawns on me that um, something my father said to me. He said, Steve, if you want to create great wealth, you have to find something that doesn't require your hands or your presence and has a multiplying effect. I didn't know what that meant until I was standing on that production line in China and making sure Teddy Ruxpin was getting boxed correctly that the inventor of Teddy Ruxman, Ken Forse, wasn't there. And he wasn't using his hands and he had a multiplying effect, fact, effect because this is a factory making Teddy Ruxman and he was collecting a royalty from it. And I was like, gee, this is what I want to do. I want to come up with ideas and collect royalties. And so it was, it had this just aha moment. And I said, and so I, I, I finally got back after living in the Far East forever in a day. And I got back and I quit. And I started, I moved to Modesto, California, um, got married. And my first idea that I sent to a company was called the Michael Jordan Wall Ball. You see, I love playing basketball and, and, I, and I knew the backboard from Ohio Art that had the license of Michael Jordan had a square backboard. And I thought, well, Michael should be bigger because uh, he was my hero. I played basketball all my life. And so I just went down and bought a poster and stuck it on the back of the backboard. You can see it here on the, on the, the slide. Now, that's a pretty awful looking prototype, I have to admit. <laughs> um, but I sent it to Ohio Art and within three days I had a contract. And they loved it. And they leveraged, by my design, they were able to leverage the license they had with Michael Jordan. And the Michael Jordan wall ball sold for over 10 years. I collected royalties. And it happened so quick. I was just hooked that here was a company that welcomed me. I didn't have any intellectual property. They took it. It was Saturday mornings. There was a cartoon with Michael Jordan. And it sold for 10 years. I collected royalties. And the first year was about $100,000. And I was like, I'm doing this. I love this. This is what I want to do. So I ended up submitting a lot of ideas to a lot of different industries. But my big idea came when I read an article. And I'm in Modesto now. I read an article how there's not, a, there's not enough information on labels. Okay. And... I had a product I had licensed that was selling in all the Disney stores and theme parks around the world. And it was a simple idea. It was a double wall plastic container that when you spun it, it just had games. And I said, well, gee, that's, maybe that could be a label. So I went down and, and went down and grabbed a product off the shelf and I tore that label off and I made a rotating label. And I'm gonna show you here, it's really simple. Here's the a, here's a container. But if you turn the label, the label turns. 
and it added more space to a container. And um, Stephen, we ended up, I ended making up making my um, board and larger on your on your prototype. We're having some people in the chat that asking if you could make your slides a bit larger. If yes. you hit Command L, and it will make it a little bit easier for everybody to see. I can make them real big. Hold on one second here. How's that? Much better. Thank you for that. Thank you, Stephen. No, you're very Stephen, welcome. If you click the arrow next to the, you see where it says fill and sign on the right side, there's that little arrow. If you can click that, that'll get rid of that. Hold this here. Uh, over here to your left there. Yeah, right down that strip there next to the seasoning. Yes, it says fill. So that little up. arrow, yeah, oh, don't click that. Click the arrow, the small micro arrow next to it. You see the little arrow to the left? It's a bit hidden in the in the, the To the left of the fill and sign? Are you? Go to the fill and sign and slowly move to your left. That, that there, yes. There How's that? There you go. Hey. <laughs> I, I figured it out. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, so I read this article, came up with a rotating label called Spin Formation, and it's so, we sold over hundreds of millions of labels. And it was probably one of my biggest ideas. And I, got, I learned a lot about intellectual property. I learned a lot about working with manufacturers in the packaging industry. And it was just exciting. Um, collected royalties for over 20 years. Um, and this particular product, at the end of the day, made millions for me. Now today, um, I'm honored to be involved on another project that's in the packaging industry once again. And what I'm involved in now is a packaging called Fishbone Packaging that eliminates the plastic rings. The plastic rings, as you know, is, is producing a mess for us um, around the world. And so Fishbone Packaging has a 100% biodegradable package to eliminate the rings. And you're gonna see this more and more coming out, not only here, but around the world. So I'm very happy to be part of this, this company and helping them bring this to market. Okay. So open innovation, let's talk about that. Now, a lot of people haven't heard about what, what is open innovation? Open innovation is really quite simple, is where companies have opened their doors for us creative people to send them ideas. And a lot of people were like, well, what, what's going on with that? Well, companies have realized that if they open their doors and allow us to send them ideas, there's a very good chance they'll find a good idea. Those companies have embraced the concept of open innovation. And Henry over here with this quote that coined the word open innovation said, Steve, if companies don't innovate, they die. So one of the, the leading ways today for companies to come up with new ideas is through licensing now. It's outpacing crowdfunding, it's outpacing traditional R&D, it's probably outpacing every other way for companies to find new innovations so they can stay competitive. So these companies that are opening their doors, I call them basically inventor-friendly companies. They want to work with us. They want us to come up with some great ideas. And these are wonderful companies. Now, what's really, one, what's really crazy about open innovation, open innovation has been around forever in some industries, such as the toy industry. It's been around probably for over 80 years. In fact, when I interviewed Brian, the head of Hasbro's head of global design, he said, Steve, 50 to, 50 to 60% of all the products in our portfolio come from people like you, from the outside our walls. And of course, um, there's a hardware company here that says over 35 to 40%. This is happening everywhere where companies are opening their doors in every different industry. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. So companies need ideas from us. And what's really wonderful about it, these companies are already in business. They have the shelf space, they have the relationships, they have the manufacturing 
when you license an idea to them, they bring it to market for you. And every time they sell your product, you collect a little royalty. It's the perfect partnership, especially for people like us that just want to be creative. We don't want to start a business. We don't want to quit our job. We don't want to risk being an entrepreneur, basically. This is like a no-risk entrepreneur model for people like us. So let me go to the next slide. So the licensing business model, it's really simple. You're, you, you're going to rent, you know, license or rent your idea to a company and they're gonna do all the heavy lifting. They're gonna bring it to market for you, do all the manufacturing, the marketing, the fulfillment. They're gonna do everything for you. And every time they sell your product, you're gonna collect a royalty on each and every one they sell. You know what I love about this? This levels the playing field for everyone now. This business model lets anybody participate. It doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter what financial situation you're in, everyone can do this. And we're, we're seeing people around the world using these techniques I'm gonna show you in just a minute of how you can contact these companies and license your creativity to them. And the number one thing I love about light, the licensing business model, it's speed. See today, to, to, to start a company takes years and takes money, it takes time. It's, it's it just, it just, there's a lot to it, right? To be successful. But with licensing, it's so fast because this company's got everything in place. So it's one of the best ways to protect yourself also is by licensing your idea to a company because they're already in business. All right, how do you tell if a company is inventor friendly? How do you tell if a company is open for you to submit ideas to them? Well, the first thing I want you to do is, is look at the, go to the company's website and, and see if, if they have products that they have licensed from, from inventors. Do they have a history of working with us creative type? Some companies today will even have an online portal. Do you have an idea? Sometimes it's at the very top, Sometimes with the navigational bar, sometimes it's a little bit lower, you have to kind of dig for it. And that will tell you, yes, there's a very good chance they, they have embraced open innovation. If they have a dedicated department to where when, when your idea goes in there, they manage it. That's a very good sign that they, they, they have embraced open innovation seriously. Also, if they're asking for money up front, they're probably not inventor friendly. So. Always make sure to ask them, do you work with inventors? That's a great way. You can reach out to them. We're going to talk about how to reach out to them in just a minute. But ask them, do you work with us? And see if they have a history of working with us. That's the best way to tell if they, they have embraced open innovation. I'm going to go through um, a few success stories with everybody. Okay. I thought there was another slide here, but I don't see it. Okay. Okay, product success stories. Because people always ask me, Steve, what industries are out there that you're seeing products being licensed? And today I'm seeing products getting licensed in just about every industry. And, I'm, and I have a list uh, in a minute I'll show you. Um, toys. We see a lot of products get licensed in the toy industry from inventors. Um, household, kitchen, very, very popular. Pets on fire, medical, yes. If it doesn't require any type of regulations, yes, you can license ideas in the medical field. Hardware, yes, they love inventors. Technology, of course. Automotive accessories, yes. Children, baby, juvenile, absolutely. They're looking for ideas from us. And even shoes, it's amazing. A good idea is a good idea, right? And companies need good ideas. All right, I'm gonna go through the 10 steps to, um, to license ideas. I've used these 10 steps my whole career. I've licensed over, I don't know, probably 20 to 30 ideas, product ideas in every different category from, from back to school, novelty, toys, packaging, um, lots of different industries. But I've also seen students of mine of a course that we teach at InventRight 
we have students in over 65 countries, we see licensing deals happen regularly with these 10 steps. So these 10 steps do work. Um, sometimes you have to kind of go off the roadmap a little bit, but come back on. But the bottom line is follow these 10 steps and they, they, they work. The first one, first step number one. Now this is, I had a call with someone today and they said the first step they wanted to patent their product. And I said, well, you might want to slow it down a little bit because that's not really your first step. Your first step is really to determine if your product is new and novel, right? And you, you want to make sure that if you're going to go forward with an idea that it's new, it hasn't been done before. And the best way to do that is with a Google image search. And what's really nice about that, you can do it anytime, day or night, and you can type in uh, the category, your, your idea you think it's gonna fall in and start to look around on the internet to see if there's any similar products or even your product idea. Now, a lot of people don't take this serious, seriously enough because what you're really looking for to see if your, your idea has a point of difference. It's okay if you find similar ideas. In fact, I hope you do find similar ideas because it tells you there's a market for it. But what you're looking for, does my product really stand out? Is it different than the other ones that are selling? So that's, that's probably the first thing you should do. The second thing to do is do a prior art search. Now, this is, sounds complicated and at first it is, but it, it becomes easier as you keep on doing it. You wanna see if there's any prior patents that have been filed um, on your invention. And you could go to the USPTO. They have a lot of information on how to do that. There's YouTube, um, a lot of YouTube videos on how to do some prior art searching. But what I want you to do, just go to the internet, go to Google, type in Google patents and just type in keywords and, and search around, look around, get used to it because the amazing thing about looking for prior patents, you're looking at the history of innovation and it's remarkable of what you can learn and be inspired. But once you start putting in your keywords of what your invention is, see if something pops up that's similar to yours. And if it does, look at it very closely and you might be able to determine, yes, that is my idea or maybe it's kind of like my idea, but not exactly. What you're doing in this very first step is you're determining, should I go forward? Should I invest more in more time? Should I dig a little deeper? You really want to know your point of difference. And so that's the very first step. And it's really fun and easy to do. In fact, what's crazy about this step, when you start to look in a micro category, right? Let's say for instance, I had an idea that's in the barbecue uh, accessory industry. Um, but it's really, I have this new, I have this new spatula, let's say, um, but it's for, for its barbecue. So if I type in barbecue accessories, it's, it's too broad. But if I start to type in barbecue spatulas and start to narrow it down in such a way that I can study the micro category. In fact, within hours, I can become an expert in a micro category. I can know all the barbecue spatulas in the world. I know their price point. I know what they're made of. I can look at Amazon reviews. I can see what people are complaining about. I can really be an expert in a micro category very quickly. And that's why the step number one is so important for you to do. Okay, step number two, invent for the marketplace. Now, traditionally, most inventors, I think that are listening to this, they have a problem that they're dealing with. And so they, they come up with a solution for their problem. Now that's one way, I think it's a very popular way, but there's some other ways to do it too. And the first thing I wanna talk about is some of the other ways. In fact, let me show you this real quick. I do it differently. I do it the easy way because I don't just see problems. I just, I'm not that type of guy. Um, but what I like to do is look at products that, that I like. And I try to make them just a little bit better. In fact, I try to make small improvements on existing products that already exist. Wow, what do you mean? Small improvements on existing products that already exist. 
I'll give you an example. I like playing basketball. I got um, the Michael Jordan hoops. You see it there on the, on the right, on the slide. I got this. I put it up in my office. I loved it. But for me, I was thinking, well, how can I make this different? What can I do? What can I do with this? And how could I make it? How could I play against Michael? That's what I wanted to do. So I took the poster, put it on the back. And I just looked at the market and made a change with the products that already exist. The reason why I do it this way, I already know there's a product, there's a market for it. They're already selling the Michael Jordan hoops. They're already manufacturing it. They're already selling it. It's proven. And so when I come up with a small improvement, it's easy for a company to say, yes, there's no risk. So that particular technique of inventing for the marketplace is really studying a, a company's product line. That's how I do it. Most inventors do it this way, which is okay too, because I do it this way too. We see a problem. Now I just told you, I don't see problems, but sometimes I'll read about a problem. And in this particular situation, I read about um, when I was in Modesto, I was reading the Modesto B in the morning and there was an article how there wasn't enough information on labels. And, and because there wasn't enough information on labels, um, people weren't taking them correctly. They were throwing out the information that was so important. Maybe it was on a leaflet, maybe it was on a box, but that important information wasn't on the label. So I came up with a, a new technology called SpinFormation. If you spin the label like I showed you here, it would give you 75% more information. And so that's what I did to solve a problem that I read about. And that's another way to, to invent for the marketplace. Now, I also have tools for me to come up with ideas. I think everyone that's listening today, you're all creative. You just don't, maybe you don't know it yet. I don't think anybody's more creative than the other person. I just think some people practice that the, they exercise the muscle of creativity. And I'm here to say that if you practice stretching, exercising that muscle of creativity, you can call upon ideas anytime you want them. And what I do, I've learned these techniques myself to play games to come up with new ideas. And one of the first games I come up with is called Mix and Match, where I take two products, completely two different products and bring them together to create something new. There's another game I play is called Solve It. I might have a problem and come up with different variations to have a sol uh, to solve it. There's another game I play and you just you dream. You go, what if, what if a, a bear could, what if a teddy bear could talk like Teddy Ruxpin, or what if I could throw a frisbee, a, a football field, and some genius came up with that particular product? It's just questioning things. The one I love the most, and someone. Um, I mentioned, I, I was watching a webinar. He mentioned, Steve, don't forget the bugs list. What's bugging you? And, and for, for people that are listening to this now, what you can do, um, if you're at home, um, follow your wife or your mother and, and watch them all during the day. What bugs them? And write down what bugs them. Or if you're working on a construction site, um, go there and follow people around. What is bugging them? What you're doing is really putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and looking at things from their perspective, but what's bothering them during the day. Now, they don't have the ability to, to maybe come up with solutions, but for you as an inventor, you can look at what's bugging them and then come up with those solutions. So these are just some really fun things for everyone to do to come up with more ideas. You have to practice. I don't believe just sitting in a room trying to pull ideas out of your head. I think it's impossible. I like to be influenced um, by going to the bookstores, going to movies, going for walks, um, traveling. I want to expose myself to all these different experiences that helps me be more creative. And I think all of us can do that, but we have to be aware of it and we have to stretch our creativity. Step number three, evaluate your ideas. I like this, but I'm going to tell everybody, no one has the crystal ball on what is a good idea. 
And if, every, if someone tells you they, they can spot a winner a mile away, I don't think so. But this is what I do when I evaluate my ideas, because I come up with a lot of ideas, but which ones do I really want to work on? I, I want to make sure whatever idea I want to work on, it does have a point of difference. Very important. It doesn't have to be a big point of difference, but it has to be different. I'm also going to look at all the products on the market, step, step number one, and make sure that it ha it's strong enough to go against the benefit. It's strong enough to compete with the similar products on the market. Okay. I also want to be a little bit aware, uh, aware that if my idea was manufactured, would the market accept it? Now, how do you do that? Well, if I can look at my product and find a similar product, and maybe mine's a little bit different, I can kind of guess at the basic level, I can kind of guess, hey, if they can do this, maybe they can do mine. If you come up with a product idea that's so expensive to manufacture that doesn't, doesn't really fit into a category, and most products have a category that, that products fit into. If it's too high or even too low, the market has a hard time accepting it. So I want to find an idea that, that maybe it can fit in with that price range of similar product ideas that are there. Size of market. Companies that are licensing ideas want to make sure the market is huge. That's very important to them. But here's the other thing. The number of potential licensees how many, how many companies out there that, that are open to open innovation? How many companies out there? See, if I have an idea, but there's only two or three companies that are really in that space, they dominate, there's not, there's not enough for me. But if I find a category where there's 100 companies looking for ideas, that's, that, that's a better strategy because you have more chances of submitting your idea to them. And understanding the potential obstacles. Every industry has obstacles. Um, some industries are hard to license to and some are very easy. And I believe I have a slide next that kind of shows the easy ones. Yes, here we go. Step number three, we're talking about evaluating your ideas. These are some industries that love us. The pet industry, toys and games, hardware, kitchen, as seen on TV, medical, automotive accessories, novelty gift, fitness, and many, many more. I can tell you those industries have embraced open innovation. Not all the companies, but a large portion of these companies want to work with us. All right. Let's go to the next slide real quick. The difficult industries, the packaging industry, the one I'm in, it's a terrible industry. It takes time. You have to understand equipment. Um, Whatever you do in the package industry, you have to realize it's going to impact probably more than one manufacturing facility. You need to understand materials, supply chain. It's not a simple idea. It, it's a little bit uh, more complicated. Software, also, this is tough too. Software, um, that industry is kind of the wild, wild west. Hard to protect certain types of software um, because they're code. If you attach some functionality some user element to that software. Maybe yes, you can get a patent on that. That allows you to realize that's not an easy industry. Um, automotive, if you're gonna be working with the, the big auto companies, that's tough. Although I have seen products get licensed to one of the top three uh, auto companies, but it was not easy. Food and beverage, a lot of people have a recipe. It's hard to protect a recipe. Um, if you've got a new package delivery system or a new way to make it, maybe, yes, you could definitely license that. But if it's just a re recipe or new formulation, very, very hard unless you start a business and have certain sales. Um, so I recommend to everybody, if, if you're just new to licensing, I would recommend finding a really simple idea first. So there's very few roadblocks and make sure to, to work in some of those industries that really embrace us. And that's what I would recommend um, if, if you're really new to this. If you have a very complex idea that's gonna require education, a lot of capital, I wouldn't work on that as my first project to license because I think it's gonna take a little bit longer and you might get discouraged. Okay, step number four, prototype your ideas. 
who doesn't like building a prototype? I love prototypes. I love to feel them, touch them, use them. There's so much to learn from a prototype, but I want to tell everybody, you don't necessarily need a prototype to license an idea. And I'm going to show you a couple of different ways to license ideas without a prototype. Now, realize though, that in many situations, it's not if you need a prototype, it's when you need a prototype. You see, prototypes can be expensive and they, they, um, they do break. Um, so, and I know a lot of us like to build prototypes. I know we do, and I do. But if you had to build a prototype for every idea you have, I think you're going to sp spend a lot of time on, on maybe prototypes that, that aren't um, licensable. So I like to test the market to see if my ideas are marketable. And then if they are, if they want a prototype, then build the prototype. And I'll talk about that in another step. So I love prototypes to show proof of concept, but realize um, prototypes can be expensive. Um, and not every company wants a prototype. Now, what's really interesting about these quotes here, the first quote is from Nick Mowbray, uh, Zoo, Zuru Toys, everybody's familiar, I think, with a bunch of balloons. When I interviewed him, he says, yes, we want to see proof of concept. Makes perfect sense. Um, another company, or not another company, but Lewis Foreman, which is um, extremely knowledgeable in this space. He said, Steve, you know, in most cases, just a rendering, uh, a sketch uh, is enough to, to get some interest. And I believe the same thing. So every company is a little bit different. Um, and you can even ask them but I like to test the market a little bit because I believe you're not licensing your prototype. You're not really licensing your patent. You're, you're really selling the experience of your product. You're selling the benefit of your product. And if you cannot sell the benefit with a tool I'm gonna to show you in just a minute, why would you go ahead and build a prototype, right? Because you're, your time is very important. You want to be smart. You want to be frugal. You want to stay in the game of, of licensing longer. You want to, because if you stay in the game longer and submit more ideas and become an idea factory, one of those ideas has a very good chance to be licensed. If you're putting all your money and time on one idea and you find out it's not marketable, then maybe you have spent too much time and money on uh, those precious resources on one particular idea that didn't go anywhere. So you have to be really careful. Okay. Um, in some industries, um, I would just show a sketch. You see it over here, over to the left. This is just a sketch of a concept. I called them fast food puppets and they licensed it just off that sketch. Um, not every industry does it this way, but some of them do. And of course, they took the sketch, they sent it over to their factory, and there's the products. And every time they sold one, I got paid just from a sketch. Let's go to the next one. I like to cannibalize things too to make prototypes. And I had this concept of um, a lunch bag for kids that after you're done with um, your lunch, you could fold it back and it folds flat. And because it folds flat, um, you can put it in your backpack or put it in your locker. And this collapsible, collapsible bag could be done. It could be big, it could be small. And sometimes I designed it to where when it was flat, it was round. So it was actually a Frisbee too. But I took an existing bag and just modified it. It was really simple to build a prototype and show the concept. Um, I love paper. And you see the prototype here to the far left was a prototype uh, that I called, um, it was a spin cup. And I showed a company this concept and sure enough, I was able to license it to a company up in Canada and it sold in every Disney theme park and store around the world just from a paper prototype. Um, so sometimes these prototypes don't have to be fancy, but it needs to show your concept. I love this prototype too. Um, this is really a works like prototype. If you look the, at the, the photograph to the left, it's just a handmade um, prototype that actually works. You press the button and the lights spin around. 
um, this particular inventor built that prototype and this product that you see to the right is called Light, Chaser, Light Chasers. And I believe he collected over $10 million in royalties and it's in every Disney theme park around the world in over 150 designs. But it was built from that works like prototype. Not very, you know, kind of rough, but it showed the concept. And of course, 3D printing, that's a great way to build prototypes. Love it. If it's small enough, it's easy to do. And another way to show a prototype is do a 3D computer generated model. You know, this is amazing. The technology we have today, this looks real. And someone built this and you could put this on some of your marketing material I'm gonna talk about in just a minute and show it to a company. If they're interested, bingo, you're in. And you didn't even build a prototype, but it looks real. All right, okay. So, but let's talk about prototypes for just a minute. You have to realize, you know, when you're working with uh, someone that's gonna build your prototype, as you're starting out, you might wanna file a provisional patent application. I'm gonna talk about that in another step. You might have someone sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement before you start sharing your idea and you can get that information from a patent attorney or a patent agent. These are a couple of things to do before you start sharing your concept to people. Now, if a company asks that you, you sent your idea to a company, they like it, they said, Steve, I love the sell sheet, it's wonderful, but I need proof of concept. Make sure you videotape your prototype working, keep it. Prototypes break. You always wanna videotape it, show it working. And, and realize it only has to be work one time too. You also today, if you just sent your prototype to a potential licensee that's looking for ideas, and if there's no instructions, they might get it and, and they might not know how to work it. And so they break it. And before you know it, it puts this, a bad taste in their mouth. Hey, this doesn't work. So. I always tell everybody, make sure if you can present your prototype today through Zoom, Skype, or even in person to do a demo, do it. Um, always have instructions of how to use it and be very careful when you're shipping your prototypes around because they do break. And guess what? You're not gonna get it back. So I'm all about being careful with the presentation, especially with the prototype. Okay. Um, let's see. Step five, there it is. Um, step five, you want to create a one sentence benefit statement. Some people call it the elevator pitch. Um, the one sentence benefit statement is probably the most powerful tool you can have to really describe the essence, the benefit, the value proposition of your product to someone quickly. And you can use that one line a one sentence benefit statement, not only in your marketing material, maybe in your outreach, it could, you could use it many, many times to really quickly, really quickly explain what your invention is. You see what happens when you ask, typically when you ask an inventor, hey, what do you, what's your invention? They go on, they talk a little bit about how it's made, how they invented it. That's not the right approach. You wanna to get to the essence so quick that a potential licensee or a customer or a retail buyer, does not matter, sees it and goes, I wanna know more. It grabs their attention instantly. It's even emotional, it just grabs them. And you have to practice at this, it's not easy to do. And I listed a couple of companies with their value proposition or their one line benefit statement. And you can just see how they're just encompassing their business in the one sentence. The most famous one for me, is when Steve Jobs created the iPod. And he said to the audience, when he gave that presentation, he said, how would you like to have a thousand songs in your pocket? He didn't explain how to make it. He didn't explain about the features of it. He, he got this emotional, he tapped into people's emotions of what they wanted. And that's, that's part of that one sentence benefit statement. And that's why it's so powerful for you to do. Now, the way you present your product idea to a company, which we call potential licensees, it's a, it's a potential company to license your idea to, is with a sell sheet. Okay, this sell sheet 
it does a lot of things for you. In fact, what it mainly does is sell for you. See, a lot of people think you have to be a salesperson, that maybe you have to fly out and do a sales presentation, but you don't. Most of the ideas that I've ever licensed, sometimes I never met the, the people before I signed the licensing agreement. Most of the signed licensing agreements we see today, they're done with a simple sell sheet. And here's the basic layout. It's a one page advertisement for your product idea. At the very top, that's called, that's your one sentence benefit statement, cleans hand, it's clean hands changing pad. You see, when you change the diaper of a, of a child, there's a good chance the baby's hands might get down below and that could create a few problems. So it keeps baby's hands out of the diaper mess. There it is. That's that one line that's very powerful. It, it, it expresses the benefit of the idea. The other thing, you have the beauty shot. This is the big product shot. You might even have a couple other pictures there, how-to pictures. This is called a, like a storyboard out, um, layout. This is how it works. You might have a couple features, some of the features of it and your contact information. It's really simple. This is, the, this is such a powerful tool to get in the hands of those companies looking for ideas from us. Anybody can do it, but make sure when you do it, it's, it's easy to understand very quick. Make sure you look at the companies you're going to submit it to and maybe pick up on some of their language or maybe look at the fonts or maybe the color. So it looks like they could take your product that you're submitting to them and they can just put it right in their product line. The, this is a very, very powerful tool, but there's another tool that's even more powerful today is the one minute video. Wow, one minute video, powerful. How many people have been watching As Seen on TV? Those little commercials that come on late at night and with one minute, they're showing you a problem, 15 seconds of a problem. And it's usually black and white and people are frustrated. And then within 45 seconds, they're showing you the solution of how, how you can use this product. And life is great. The music is on, rainbows, and everything is wonderful. The one minute video is a very important tool. And if you have a prototype, realize it only has to work one time. That's what's really great about these one minute videos. They're fun to watch, it shows your product and you control the pitch. If you wanna know more about these one minute videos, make sure to go to All Star Innovations. They created the Snuggie and watch all their little videos there. And that's the format any of us can do. And realize it doesn't have to be fancy. You could do it on your, your iPhone. You can learn how to sh shoot a short little commercial and, and you can do it yourself. You can even hire someone to do the voiceover. It's the most powerful tool today to license ideas. It's your one minute video and anybody can do it. Okay, protect your ideas. I wanna talk a little bit about protecting your ideas because I know a lot of you out there are thinking, I need a patent. Now I'm a patent owner. I've got over 20 patents in my name over and, and I've defended my patents in federal court. I love patents, but do you need a patent on every idea you have? I don't think so. Um, a lot of ideas go in and out of the market really quick these days. And so you, you might have an idea, you license it to a company and, and they bring it to market, they sell it. And, and why wait for a patent to issue? And maybe if it issues, maybe the life of the product's over. But more than that, Today, it's hard to protect anything because of all the online sellers. So I tell everybody, it's not about patenting so much today. It's about finding those companies that wanna work with us, finding those companies that embrace open innovation because they know today it's really speed to market because it's, no one wants to chase people, sue people. It, it's, just a, it's just a very time consuming, um, thing to do. And it's a, in my opinion, it's very difficult to do and it's hard to do because I have been through it. But what you do need at the very beginning, when you decide that your product is new and different, if you decide, you decide your product has a point of difference and you've done your homework, you do need to file a provisional patent application and it has to be done correctly. That gives you the opportunity 
to file a non-provisional for a patent, or maybe even the company you license it to, it gives them the option. So that's the least you can do. And it's a fantastic tool at the USPTO. Now, I asked, I wrote this book that Sherry put up um, that she listened to, Become a Professional Inventor. And I interviewed 30 industry experts in 17 different industries and I asked them, do you care? What do you care? What do you think about patents? And I can tell you, it was all over the board. Um, Zuru Pets, I showed you that. They say they're nice, but you know, they're not essential. Wow, I was a little surprised. Um, some companies say no, but some companies say yes. I've noticed that some of the really big, big companies um, care a little bit more about intellectual property. Okay, because they're big and maybe they can file a lawsuit or maybe they can push the retailers to pull off the copycats. But overall, most innovation companies have realized it's not about chasing people. It's about selling. It's about good customer service. It's about all those other things. So file a well-written provisional patent application. It's, it's not that difficult to do. In fact, I think I've got some tips here too. Let's see. Well, let's first of all talk about the benefits. Um, it's affordable. I love it. You can write it yourself, even better. It gives you one year of patent pending. But if you do file it, make sure you do a little bit of homework. And if you're going to work with a patent agent or patent attorney, make sure you're giving them really good stuff. Um, know your point of difference in the marketplace. Know your point of difference against prior arts. S steal it from yourself. How would someone work around my idea? Include in your PPA some workarounds or variations because there's more than one way to probably probably solve your problem. So do some do a lot of work. So when you do work with a professional patent practitioner, they can really do a good job for you. Or if you decide to do it yourself, you can do a good job yourself. And make sure to include any manufacturing know-how, know -how, maybe in materials. What I'm telling you really, you, your IP, your patents or non-provisionals are only good as the information you research and no one's gonna do this but you. But the, what's the great thing about it is you can do it. If, if you slow down and, and realize, hey, look, I need to gather all this information myself because no one is going to do it better than you. No one's gonna care as much as you do. You have to be the expert. Okay, let's see. Let's talk about working with a patent attorney or patent agent. Um, where I think this is really, really important is realizing that um, if you're going to work with somebody, make sure they understand your technology and they kind of specialize in it because some of them specialize in different areas and making sure that you give them your point of difference. I talked about that. Make sure you've done some prior art searching or hire somebody, good idea. Make sure you know what's out ahead of you. Make sure you know what material. Um, make sure you're, you're telling your your patent agent or patent attorney, what are you really trying to license? Let them look at your marketing material, show them variations, show your, your patent attorney all the different ways this could possibly be made. And if you have um, how it would be manufactured, that's very helpful, but also ask that patent practitioner their pricing structure. Make sure they tell you all about the billing, not only for the initial filing, but for office actions later because you really need to understand and budget for the whole process. You don't want to come up short. Okay. Reaching out to those companies that want ideas from us. It's never been easier to find those companies today. You have to go on LinkedIn, put yourself, make a profile on LinkedIn, make it look like, you know, have a nice photograph, fill it out completely. The way to get the companies today is through LinkedIn. It's never been easier. There's no gatekeepers. You don't have to call anybody or send an email. Do it through LinkedIn. People ask me all the time, Steve, what do I say? And I wrote a book just on this topic um, called Licensing Ideas Using LinkedIn. But I wanted to put a couple scripts here for you to see. And some of these are really simple. Hello, my name is Stephen Key. I have a new product I'd like to submit to your company for review. Do you know who handles open innovation submissions? Very simple. I'm not trying to pitch. I'm not trying to get them to click on a link. 
I'm really just trying to find the right person to have that conversation with. And there's another script there. And of course, here's a little bit longer one that I talk a little bit about. I've done a little bit of homework on the company. I know they're really a good fit. So I might wanna add a little bit more information. Hi, my name is Stephen Key. I'm a product developer from Los Angeles, California. I've developed a patent pinning heated stress re reducer that I believe would absolutely be a perfect fit for your company. I'm making it a little bit more personal. I've done some homework. This is okay too. This is a great way to start it off. But what you're trying to do is not pitch, not sell. You're trying to find the right person within that company that you can start the conversation. It takes a little bit of time, but if you do it correctly, you'll be surprised at how fast you can get the companies today. You can get to anybody today. There's no gatekeepers anymore on LinkedIn. There's no one holding you back. Only you are holding yourself back. So this is a great way to contact companies. Now, be patient. People ask me, Steve, well, how long should I wait when I submit an idea to a company? You know, first of all, you need to ask them their process. How long does it take? What is your process uh, of looking at ideas from the outside? Is it a month? Is it 10 days? What do I need to ex expect? Also, in our new book, we have some things that you could actually say to ask them where they are. It's really simple, but you really want to understand what is the process? Because you don't want to be waiting by the phone, but be patient. Give them 10 days, 14 days. Give them some time to look at it, to bring the right people in the room to do a good evaluation. So I know it's hard. It's hard for me. I know it's hard for you, but please be patient. Okay, rejection. Rejection is the numbers. You know, it's funny. I could wallpaper my office with rejection letters. I don't take it personal. personal. I believe it's a numbers game. Like in life, you have to knock on a lot of doors. I tell everybody, be a no collector. Send your ideas to companies, build those relationships and collect those no's because in those no's, there's a very good chance you're gonna find a yes. Now, what's really great about this rejection, even if you get a rejection from a company, you're in. You submitted it, you have a contact, you have a relationship, submit more ideas so it just gets easier. So I never look at this as being a bad thing, it's just part of it. Um, it's really about building relationships and that's why I look at rejections as not just no now, maybe, maybe no now, but maybe not later. I've also noticed that once you get rejected the first time, you can resubmit again months later and sometimes I've seen products get licensed to the same company six months later because things change. But be polite and take it and, and listen, maybe ask for feedback too. Number nine, licensing agreements. I could talk for days on this topic. I love licensing agreements. They're all different though. And all licensing agreements, if you find them on the internet, um, they're all gonna be a little bit different. I also believe that when you license an idea to a company, it's really their job to provide the licensing agreement because they have more leverage, they know what they want. But what's gonna happen when you get the deal, it's gonna come over and you're gonna look at it and you're gonna go, oh, this thing is horrible. At the very beginning, they're usually boilerplate, um, but it takes a little bit of skill I've written a little bit about that process in one of my other books, how to license an idea with or without a patent that talks about that correspondence back and forth. But the big things in a licensing agreement is exclusivity. Are you gonna give them the right to sell it and nobody else? The royalty rates, that's basically 5% is pretty standard. It could be a little bit lower, it could be a little bit higher, but 5% of their wholesale price of what they're selling in the stores is it's pretty common. Minimum guarantees, you have to have some type of performance in your licensing agreement that if they don't sell a certain amount of product, you get it back. If you do not have minimum guarantees in your licensing agreement, they don't have to sell one. So, you know, and they still have it. They still have some rights to it. So that's something really important. And improvements, they're gonna make improvements. Who owns those? There's so many different parts of a licensing agreement, but here's my recommendation. When you get one, congratulations, take a deep breath. You'll do just fine. You're probably gonna need two people to help you. One person that understands the business terms 
And then you're going to need a licensing attorney that understands the legalese. They're very different. The business terms, how to get good minimum guarantees, how to negotiate a good royalty rate, how to do some ownership of improvements, IP, the other stuff like indemnification, all the other stuff that has to do a little bit about protecting yourself. It's a combination of both. That's a perfect team to help you get a good licensing agreement. Do not do it by yourself. I'll tell you, if you do, you'll probably end up regretting it. All right, step number 10. I tell everybody, this is really simple. Do this over and over and over again. Do it as much as you can. Be an idea factory. That's how this works. All right, things to do. All right, make sure your product submission is new and novel. We talked a lot about it. Don't send your idea to a company in which they can Google your idea and find it within minutes. I hear that complaint all the time. Don't do that. You're wasting your time and the company's time. Make sure your product submission fits into the company's product line. If you're submitting to a kitchen company, don't send them a pet product. It doesn't fit. Make sure you really understand their product line. Slow it down. Build a relationship. Reach out to them on LinkedIn. Get to know the person. Understand their process. That's the best way. Most ideas that get licensed don't get licensed through a portal. They get licensed because you've built a relationship and you know the process and you know the company. And be patient. It does take a little bit of time but it's because people are busy. Be reasonable. Be an asset. Don't give them any reason to work around you. Don't give them a reason to do something like come up with some variation or work around. Be reasonable. Be part of their team. And this is the most important part. Be an ambassador. Be polite. Be that asset. So what you're doing when you're doing that, you're allowing the next inventor that knocks on the door, you're, you're leaving a good impression. And that's very important to me because if more and more companies are doing the right thing, the doors stay open. The minute we do the wrong things, the doors close. And we want to keep those doors open. And we want to leave a good impression with all those companies that we're dealing with. Keep educating yourself. It's the most important thing you can do. I, just, I believe in it. I've written a lot of articles on this and a lot of videos. I'll talk about that in a minute. And join your local inventors group. It's the best thing you can do. Learn from others. Find like-minded individuals. It's just priceless. Okay, books. I'm going to go through some of these books real quick. My basic book, One Simple Idea. It's been translated in five different languages. It's got a few five-star reviews. This is the basics. If you want to learn the basics of licensing, this is the book you should purchase. You can find it at your local library even, and make sure you get the updated and the revised one, okay? That's my first book uh, from McGraw-Hill. The second book, Sell Your Ideas With or Without a Patent, that just talks about strategies, how to write a good PPA and how to sign a licensing agreement, even without any, any lecture how to sign a licensing agreement with no intellectual property at all. The things that really shock people today, most of the products we see get licensed, there's no patents. And that shocks a lot of people. Okay, uh, I just wrote this last year. Sherry, thank you for mentioning this. This is really a thick book, okay? I'm sorry, but I got so interested in reaching out to industry experts and hearing what they had to say. I know I can give you my perspective, but I wanted big companies, small companies, all different industries to tell us what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And how can we become professionals? And I think if you don't have this book, um, you're making a huge mistake because it really goes over all the industries as well as what works and what doesn't work. Okay. Licensing ideas using LinkedIn. That's my brand new book. Talks all about how to use LinkedIn. Cold calling is dead. Yes. Connect the companies that are looking for new ideas through LinkedIn, it's easy to do. I've written, written 1,000 articles for Forbes Inc. and Entrepreneur. You can find me in all those places. Wow. Go to my YouTube channel, InventRight TV, 600 videos, how to license your product ideas. It's absolutely free, and I think you'll really enjoy it. And I'm done. <laughs> Woo! Wow, this is just... <laughs>
what I expected it to be. Fantastic. So thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I can't uh, express that enough. Uh, I want to forward, uh, uh, Mike has some questions from the chat, so I'm going to have him go ahead and get started. And I have uh, some slides with some info closing information that I don't have to get to right away. So let's go ahead and have at it, Mike, as far as the questions. Or did you want me to read the questions in the chat? Let's see here. Gary, I'll start us off while you're uh, reading that one there. So the first one we had was, what if you submit an idea, Stephen, through a submission portal and don't hear back one way or another? How do you reach out to them again? And what would be your recommendation? It drives me nuts when that happens, but it does happen. And I've asked companies, hey, you submitted it through the portal and you guys don't get back to me. What are you doing? And this is what they've told me. They said, Steve, sometimes we can't get back to everybody. Right. And we're going to try. We're going to do the best job we can. Um, sometimes we might come back and say it's not a good fit. Sometimes if, if we have time, we might even explain why it's not a good fit. But regardless, if you don't get a response back, try to find that person or that department or someone within that company through LinkedIn and say, look, you know, hi, I'm a product developer. I reached out to your company, I submitted it, and I didn't get a response through the portal. Perfectly fine. You could even call the company up if they have an 800 number, talk to someone too. You could do that too. It's okay to ask, but give yourself some time. The, the, the thing that I don't want you to do, if you don't hear back, you know, five days, start bugging them. Don't do that. Give them some time to review it. And Stephen, what about the success story? So you secure a license, uh, licensing agreement, and uh, you're excited and they've agreed to your terms. What does that look like? What does that aftermath, immediate aftermath look like? Because you don't become a millionaire overnight uh, or even close to it with royalties, right? So no. what's a realistic, what should be a realistic expectation Okay. Uh, uh, once you secure a licensing deal? When does the money come in and, and how does it trickle in? Well, that's a wonderful question because in my opinion, it can never come in quick enough. It, <laughs> it, it does take a little bit of time. You have to realize once you sign it, it probably takes a year for those royalties to start to come in. Really? Yeah, it could be shorter. D depends on the complexity of your product, but you have to realize they have to manufacture it. They have to ship it. They have to reach out to retailers. They have to get it, maybe trade shows. The, the retailers have to do a pentagram. I mean, it's complicated. So it takes some time. So usually in your licensing agreement, um, they usually give them, it's called a runway. You give them a little bit of a runway before those royalties come in. So when it comes to minimum guarantees, they pay you, you know, after that first year, that's when it starts to kick in when they have to pay you. But give them a little bit of time, right? So... Safe, I would say a year. I've seen this short as six months. I think that's really fast. I don't think that's normal. Um, if, it, if you hit it at the wrong timing too, right? Maybe you're, you, you hit it where it wasn't quite the right timing. It might even take a little bit longer. And sometimes they'll give you a holding fee. Sometimes they'll pay for maybe your IP. There's some other things they can do to, to satisfy some of your expenses along the way, right? And another important thing that you covered, you covered so much in that book, uh, but about the pandemic, a lot of people are probably thinking oh. companies are not interested right now. And that's not true. There are some that are. And yeah, are really was, encouraging submissions. Talk about that. Yeah, I was really surprised. Um, in March, I was concerned like everybody else. So um, at InventRight, we held uh, a free webinar every week for nine months. And what we did, I invited companies to come on, um, some really big companies. We had Hasbro okay. on, we had Lifetime Brands on, we had all these big companies, some of the biggest- Did you record companies. those sessions? Are we able to go online to see them or is that- Yeah, some of those are on InventRight TV. Yes, we put them okay. over there. Okay. But this is what happened. They said, no, Steve, things have slowed us down a little bit, okay? Supply chain, we have a little hiccup here, but we'll get that fixed. Um, we have to do things a little differently. Right. So you have to give us a little bit of time. It used to be we'd all be in the same room when we would review a product submission. Now we're doing it on Zoom. Okay, so, okay. So give us a little bit of time, be a little patient with us, but we need ideas. We have to have ideas. Now, 
what I noticed, we, we probably have seen more ideas get licensed during COVID than we had prior to that. So, because when one door sh shut down, five more opened. Okay, it just shifted. It just kind of shifted. Open. So, and that's what it was really surprising that it didn't stop. It didn't, it's, it got a little hiccup, but it got right back on track. Um, Henry Chesbro said, and this, I truly believe this, if companies don't innovate, they die. So that COVID's, is true. Not, gonna, that's, COVID's not gonna stop it. Yeah. And so I'm looking at the chat. That's the reason why I look distracted. So I'm looking at some of the questions. I'm gonna try to get as many in as possible. Um, is there a list to find the best companies? Yeah, everybody wants a magical list. Okay, let me tell everybody, you don't need a list. Okay. And everybody's like, come on, Steve, make it easy. Make it really easy for us. No, you make your own list. I'll tell you the reason why. Okay, and I'll tell you how easy it is to make the list. All right, go down. If you think your product is going to sell at Walmart, and this is really a great question, by the way. Go down to Walmart and find that aisle. And if you don't know what aisle it should be on, ask the store manager. Hey, I've got this idea of this. Where am I going to be in your great store? And they're going to say, you're going to be here. Now, everybody that's in that aisle is your potential licensee. Everyone that's in that aisle. Ah, that, yeah, I see. Like okay. See, and that's your list. Okay, and so again, customize uh, plan for innovation. Everyone's going to be different, so I like that. You know what it does? It really, it really makes sure you zero in on where you're going to be and call those companies. That's the best list you can make, and then go online, look at them, see if the online portal, reach out to them, LinkedIn, but make your list and and do this. Realize this. And I didn't say this earlier. Very very big companies, the market leaders, don't license much. When I tell everybody, make your list of 30 companies you're going to reach out to, the big ones are the first 10. Of course they are. They're our favorites. They got the best distribution, the best But brand. Stephen, you also have a caution uh, to inventors to not overdo it because you can ruin it for other inventors. In other words, don't just throw everything or anything under the developed at license, yeah. targeted licensees uh, and it's not in their uh, area as far as product, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, before I get to that though, I just wanna say, go after the mid-sized companies. Ah. They're, they're still big, but they're hungry because they wanna be big companies. So the big guys don't license much, they're, they're risk averse. Go with the smaller guys, they love you. Okay, the second um, the thing I wanna to mention to you, make sure when you make that list of 30, really go and look at their website very carefully. And make sure your product is a good fit. The number one complaint that I hear from them is that people are sending us an idea and they don't even know what our product line is. Right. That's the point. I was, yeah, exactly. So, so this is what happens. You go to us. I have a kitchen gadget. I find a kitchen company. They have an online portal. I just, I press the button. I want to submit. No, you haven't, you haven't taken the time to even know who they are. Look, read about their mission statement, read about their culture, read their blog, understand their product line. What materials are they using? What price point? Who are their customers? Do that type of homework. So, and they will appreciate that you have. See, they know the difference. They know the difference if you just throw in an idea up against the wall or you have really designed it for them. And, and with brand new inventors address this as well they're going to be shy about submitting something online because what happens inventors are so protective of their idea because there's no nda involved right so uh tell them how to manage that trust that is required of them if they're going to submit something online and, and tell them the risk that are involved as well yeah let's talk about the fear because I like to kick it to the curb right here. Okay. <laughs> because everybody's fearful. I'm telling you guys, don't be fearful. Be careful, but not fearful. Okay. There are always going to be companies that they're, they're, they're less so today than ever. I don't think companies want to steal ideas. 
companies that embrace open innovation, if they steal an idea, the doors close. So, and word gets out really quick. See, if you treat someone poorly today, it gets talked about really quick, especially today on, with social media. So, and companies, can you imagine if you're in a meeting an idea comes in and someone says, hey, let's steal this idea. That's not good morale. It doesn't happen that way. But they might be working on the same idea in the back. You don't know. Exactly. Okay, and inventors, that needs to be emphasized because that's the reason why we are required to conduct patent search searches, trademark searches, because you're thinking that there's no way someone could have come up the same name because you mixed your children's names together or what have you. And sure enough, you look online and it's on the trademark. Someone has been using it for 10 years. And the same thing applies with patents. Even though you may submit it to a company and you don't have it as a product, you sure enough could look up and they'll have it, but they're not, it's not because they stole it from you. It's yeah. because it was probably already in the making. So that's another thing that inventors need to become aware of. Yeah, and, and some companies will tell you that. In fact, we had someone recently, one of my students, um, submitted an idea and a year and a half later, there it was. Exact idea. Uh -huh. So they went back to the company, showed the sell sheet, and the person said, no, I'm really sorry. We were working on it before you submitted it. And here's the dated photograph of the... So they, they were able to produce because they were, they were just trying to say, hey, look, we still want to work with you. We did not take it, but we were working on it prior to you. And so that's why they, they should have good documentation. But the best protection really is just finding companies that want to work with us, right? And, and learn all the tools at the USPTO. They're amazing tools. Speaking of USPTO, uh, we're talking about filing uh, intellectual property, IP. Um, there, uh, and it's also the Library of Congress uh, for the copyrights. What's your advisement uh, for, I have a question here about someone that has a, uh, a product for the workout industry, they uh, titled it, and wanted to, they want to start production and what type of prote protection do they need? Uh, and that's a simple question, but if you could just address it on a, um, a broader scope so that it applies to everyone as far as what do you recommend as far as provisional patent applications or utility patents or copyrights or what have you, or trademarks for that matter. When is it too soon to do it? And when should they rush to do it? Or should they re uh, rely upon NDAs, non-disclosure agreements? Well, NDAs are done state by state and everybody thinks they're gonna be this protection vehicle. They set a tone of professionalism is what they do. They're great tools if you have a trade secret NDAs, like a recipe, great tool. But you have to do more than that, okay? Right. Um, if you think your products, if you think you have a product and you're gonna be selling it on Amazon, you don't really need a patent. What you need is file a trademark what you probably need to do is do a, a copyright, trademark, and a design patent. Because those are the three tools that if you've done that ahead of time, it takes six months or longer. But if you've done that ahead of time, when someone has taken your idea and they've copied it, you can go on to the online seller and produce those, IP, those intellectual property protections and they take it down. See? Well, we're talking pre-product uh, development. So if you... If you that I would always recommend to everybody, file a provisional patent application. Learn okay. how to do it. File it. Learn how to do yep. it yourself. File it. We just had a class it. on that uh, this week, but go ahead. I, <laughs> I love that tool. Uh, learn as much as you can about that tool, but I would always do that. And then make sure if you're going to share it around, have people sign an NDA. Why not? Yeah. And if you're going to have someone help you work on it, have them sign an NDA with work for hire language, meaning any work you do, I still own. Now, Stephen, there are some advice that you're giving as far as promoting um, uh, DIYers, do it yourself. But then you also um, recommend that uh, you should get an attorney. Don't there? You shouldn't try to do everything uh, on your own, especially initially. So we have someone that asks, uh, at what point do you need or would you recommend an attorney? Well, I think you need to help your attorney do a good job. So I okay. think you do some of the work yourself. Um, 
I think you should learn how to do a provisional patent application yourself. And I think you can. Um, I think if you learn how to do it correctly and it goes to a non-provisional, you've just given your patent attorney or patent agent what they really need. If, if you're not comfortable with that, still do the homework that you give to them. See, I think what happens is that we find a patent attorney or patent agent and say, hey, we have this invention, here's my prototype. That's not enough today because you're just protecting maybe your invention, but not the innovation. You, you want to protect in such a way that keeps everybody out that does different things or maybe variations. So your patent attorney is only as good as the information you provide them, right? So it's really, I'm throwing it back on the inventor to do a better job. Okay. Right. And, to be and informed. I, okay. And, and I have a, an article coming up next week in Forbes on how to write a bulletproof patent because, oh. well, I just, I don't think we're taking this seriously enough. We think we are, but I think there's more that we can do. Also realize about patent attorneys, um, they're, they're great. Some of them you have to kind of manage like anybody else. But I was going to say some. <laughs> but overall, do this. Uh, make sure they've done good work. Read their work. Make sure you understand it. it's clear to read it. Um, you can also see how many patents have been issued. You can find that out at the USPTO, how successful they are. Make sure ask them how do they handle office actions? Do they have interviews? Very important to over, overcome those office actions. Make sure you find someone that's very comfortable with your technology. Very, very important. And if you're really on a budget, find a patent attorney in the middle of the country. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the average cost because you know what? circulating in the innovation community is that in, in order to get a good attorney, it's going to cost five to $10,000. That's a big gap. But, you know, for those of us who are comfortable filing things ourselves, um, that's a lot, you know? So what would you recommend is too much for an attorney because people run out of money affording an attorney? And then what's reasonable so that people can budget and plan who, who don't, have, who lack the wherewithal to try to devise legal documents? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And it's a very important one. I do believe if you're going to license an idea, you use a PPA, which you can file it yourself for $70. It gives you a year to determine if your product has legs. So that that's a great tool to go out and see if there's interest. And if there's interest, what we try to help people with is negotiating with the company that they pay for the IP. Okay. That's one way to, to, and usually what happens, they pay for the IP, but they deduct that from future royalties. It's good business okay. for both parties. Okay. But that being said, um, every invention is a little different. Some are more complex than others. Okay. Um, I've seen patent attorneys, file great patents, great patents for five grand, which is unheard of. I've paid, I've seen paying $20,000 for a patent attorney and get something that's terrible. No, that's so it's, not, <laughs> so it's not about the money. Right. You don't get better with the money. See? But you, you never know. know what you're going to get, but you should also, I would think it would be reasonable to cap how much you're going to spend and have that conversation with your attorney. This oh. is my budget. What yeah, you, 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 yeah, you have to. And that's why I said, know their billing and know what it's going to cost and get an estimate. I've seen it to where they've got an estimate and they've gone over. They went back to the original quote. Right. So it's very important to, to, to find the, you know, this is like a partnership. I hate to, your patent attorney. I mean, you're like getting married to this this person because this is your baby and they're kind of helping you. And so find one that you can work together, find someone that's got a lot of referrals too, and ask them, okay. um, ask them who else they've worked with and talk to them. How do they work? How do they bill any in, unexpected billing? But big isn't necessarily better, but I can tell you this. If you think you have a big idea and you're going to, you're going to probably be defending it. You might, have a you might need a bigger budget 
in that. You That's find true. I'm glad you brought that up because the complexity of your innovation matters as well. Yeah, because I might want a firm that's got a big name, right? And they've got a litigation department. Yes. So, so, okay. So they write it with litigation in mind. See, that's the one thing, because I've been through litigation and the firm that was with, that did this for me, they had a litigation department and I'm so happy they did because they wrote it in such a way that when I did get to court, um, I had a fighting chance. But I don't think yeah, you get to court. You need a, an attorney. We can agree yeah. on that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just, think, yeah. yeah. So I just think you need to really look at your project very closely. Um, my patents usually are about twenty five thousand. Ah, okay. I have another question. It says, "How do you get around those companies who say they only work through a toy association licensed broker?" That's so old. That's just old. Um, <laughs> What's happened typically in that industry, see the toy industry at one time, kind of like they just, it was like a, a old boys club. It was hard to get in there. And they this had year. certain inventors they worked with and you had to go through brokers and they had a screening process, but that's been kind of tearing, that's, that's been torn down now because of social media. And I really like it now because they realize an idea can come from anybody at any time. Um, we interviewed the head person at Hasbro that's looking for ideas. And he says, I'm really happy to be on this webinar and not have toy inventors because I want to find a good idea from someone that's not even in the industry. They're changing. They have online portals, but do realize about the toy industry. It's, it's very competitive. Um, they have two portals. They have the amateur portal on their line. Then they have the professional portal that do, do, you don't even exist. You don't even know exists. <laughs> okay. If you have to work with the toy, if you want to work with toy and broker, it can be a great experience. Find the right one. Make sure they're willing to represent you correctly. Everything's fair. And, and they're going to make maybe connections for you eventually. So you have those relationships. Quickly, what does that entail for those of us who have no knowledge of, you know, a toy broker? What is what is that process, real quick, in a condensed format? Yeah, a toy uh, broker. Find out the company. Go ahead. Yeah, typically a toy broker will share in the royalty. I think it's a 50-50. A toy uh -huh. broker might ask for some money up front to evaluate it. A toy broker is in the game, has all the contacts. Okay. Okay. Uh, but you don't need them as much today just because more of those companies are gone online, right? And you can, but if you're really serious about the toy industry, go to Shy Tag in New York, uh, in Chicago, when it opens up. Shy Tag is for amateurs and pro toy inventors. It's a great way to make connections, learn from it. Wonderful, Mary does a great job over there. Go to Toy Fair in New York when that opens back up again. Do a lot of homework, whoever you wanna work with, get referrals, okay? Uh, you have someone that wants to know, uh, can you submit your idea to more than one company at a time? Yeah. That's, that's better. <laughs> I, I tell everybody, if amateurs submit to one company, pros submit to all of them. Okay, so. There you go. <laughs> right, but not in every industry. Every industry but one. The one industry you do not want to do that with is the DRTV as seen on TV industry. Right because there's only four or five major players. They all know each other, right? So okay. just do one at a time. In that industry. Okay. Yeah. Does having a product produced and on the market, such as on Amazon, increase chance for licensing? Yes and no. Um, if you can show that you've sold some product and maybe you just weren't set up, maybe you, know, you did it okay, but you can show sales, that's a big deal. You took away risk. Now, if you're out there actively selling and maybe your sales didn't go so well, or, or maybe you're out there, maybe some companies might look at that and go, you know, maybe no. But I do think whenever you can take away risk, hey, I've got this idea, I'm selling it on Amazon and I don't even know what I'm doing and look how many I sold. They're gonna love it. Uh, here's a good question. Are company, companies only interested in massive potential product ideas uh, or 
are they also open to niche products that much uh, that may sell approximately five to twenty thousand units? And I think that number is low, but most definitely welcome niche. Tell them about the niche market. Well, it's changing a little bit today because companies can market on social media for the first time. And the DRTV industry told me it used to be we were looking at really big ideas that would sell in the millions, right? Because it's very expensive to put it on TV and everything else that they do. But because of social media marketing now, such as Facebook, we can target uh, select groups. It doesn't cost as much. So the typical price range of like 1995 can be anywhere from 5995. So it's changed. So they're looking at products that'll have a higher price point and a smaller volume. So yes. Yes. Uh, and I and I'm noticing that there are a lot of questions about the provisional patent uh, and patenting uh, that will require that uh, kind of teeters into the legal advisement, which we're not uh, wanting to do um, here. So I will encourage you guys to go to the um, uh, inventstl.org uh, website. Uh, that's the Inventors Association of St. Louis website because it lists the previous presentations and the speakers that we just had on Wednesday that address these specific topics. Like, uh, would you recommend using a patent attorney? Well, no, well, there was another one. Would you recommend using a patent attorney for a provisional uh, patent application? We just had a class on Wednesday uh, show by USPTO um, regional uh, Midwest Regional Office, um, and they were very helpful in providing information about how to file yourself um, and uh, whether or not you know you should use an attorney, which you don't have to. Just know that that's an option, but we're not here uh, to tell you yay or nay. And then you all have some other questions about a utility patent. But I want to share something real quick before we run out of time, and then uh, we'll come back and, and address a few uh, more questions. Uh, let's see. There you go. Um, we have an, an event. Are you all able to see the screen? Yes. Okay. We have an event uh, that's coming up. That's a con uh, continuation of what we're doing today. It's all happening in February, throughout the month of February. So again, visit uh, inventstl.org. And it's in celebration of National Inventors Day, February 11th, and then other dates as well. Uh, I'm encouraging each of you to uh, attend one in particular, and that is the one where you meet the patent experts and learn about resources because some of the things that uh, you're asking about will be covered. And the highest of the high uh, officers of USPTO will be present. And the whole session is a two hour session, about an hour and a half, two hour session dedicated to introducing you to programs that exist and that are new, and then also asking you uh, what type of services, resources, uh, gaps in um, uh, different programs, uh, and things that have uh, hindered your progress. We want that information to give it to USPTO so that they can devise programs or uh, change their services and outreach efforts to reach you. So in other words, help us help you, because this is the one time, uh, not one time, but uh, mm -hmm. one of those instances where your um, voice mm -hmm. matters. So if you've ever had any complaints or concerns mm -hmm. about, um, mm -hmm. here it is, meet the USPTO experts, have a phone call coming, uh, learn about inventor program sessions. So that's uh, on Inventbrite. So we do encourage you to consider that. But I also wanted to use this slide. So you've learned, you know about the inventor television shows, the Shark Tanks and things like that, the Profit and Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch. Uh, keep in mind that Stephen uh, has written articles uh, for them. If you want copies of this particular recording, uh, then you can visit the youtube.com users uh, Scandalera Center. The reason why I'm bringing them up is because that's something that it seems far-fetched and you can't, you know, um, really, you wonder how do you get on those shows and that type of deal. But this type of information, uh, it's valuable because Stephen has a, uh, his 
online YouTube channel that provides the same information in more detail on a regular basis. As he mentioned, did you say he said have 600 uh, videos on YouTube, uh, Stephen? It's, I think it's over 650. And There you go. And so they're providing this information free. So when you get on these shows, they're, they're telling you that they can do it for you. Where this is, uh, a, 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 I guess I want to say television. That's why I'm stuttering. It's like, do I call it a television show? And I guess because in my heart, I'm thinking that that's what it should be. So, Stephen, that should be your next step. <laughs> if they can do it, you can do it. So you need to get on the phone with uh, Mark Burnett. Is that who's in charge of Shark Tank? And your contact at uh, Entrepreneur. We need to make this happen. But I also want to encourage you guys to visit uh, the Scandalera Center uh, site so that uh, as far as the recording for this particular uh, session, so that you can provide feedback to Stephen and uh, Andrew. Uh, and so that they will know how you help them. It encourages them and inspires them to keep doing what they've been doing for 20 years. I don't even think that we've mentioned that, Stephen, uh, that you've been doing, how long you've been doing this and, and helping other inventors. But then also we want to hear, I'm serious about this. Um, we need you to communicate how you benefit from a television show because nowadays you never know who's looking, <laughs> who's watching, and they may look up. And I know you would love to see a licensing uh, program. So with that said, I want you to dare to invent and remember to dream big, as we mentioned, as I mentioned at the beginning of the slides, that each Stephen and I each had a dream at the same time. <laughs> it just so happens to be on Martin Luther King Day. It's just really crazy. But when you dream big and you and you move forward in that direction, you can you see what can materialize. Um, and I want you to be encouraged to reach out to the Inventors Association. Also, the Scandalair Center has something that they want to share with you as far as the programs that they have uh, coming up. Great. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. What a presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen Key, for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. Uh, you now have me super excited. And on that note, I'm going to encourage everyone to go to ideabounce.com. Ideabounce.com is an online platform where you can post your idea and connect with other invest inventors globally. Also, I'd like to make an announcement that we have our Women in STEM webinar that will be happening on February 11th. And if you have any additional questions or would like to get connected, uh, please go visit our website at sc.wusul.edu. Okay, let me say this too, because I'm thinking that this would, uh, if you go to the recording on YouTube and you guys who have, because I'm showing 44 questions here and you want to post questions uh, on the YouTube page, perhaps Stephen, at some point or another, uh, if you can just drop in and then offer some uh, feedback to those individuals who didn't get their questions answered. And if you can't answer, just let them know that as well. Okay. Other than that, I want to thank Stephen Key for signing up without hesitation and for providing such a wonderful, wonderful presentation that's filled with knowledge uh, and a unique uh, subject matter that no one else is addressing fully. And, you know, Stephen, I told you that in my, my initial letter to you, that keep doing what you're doing. I do encourage you guys to buy the book, not because we're trying to sell anything. Stephen doesn't care about that. It's because it is a manual. It is something that it's a workbook that's going to be workbook, meaning uh, that it's going to help you work through the licensing process. And I'm telling you that it will walk you through every ask. You won't have any questions left about how to license. All you're going to probably uh, question is how to get started yourself with your particular idea. Other than that, all the information will be there for you. Thank you so much for uh, showing up and uh, you guys have a great evening.